bless you. It's fine. I speak to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our focus for this message is revolutionary uh, love on Trinity Sunday. We're looking at John 3 16. When we're in Uganda at the Hague Foundation's Convention, John 3 16. Uh, was the focus, and that's, that would be sort of our, our road uh, map as we tell you that about our trip. So it took us about 36 hours to uh, get to Uganda, including getting in the airports, and so of course the Janus uh, built in some uh, time to recover uh, from. Uh, you know, being jet lag. And so, what did we do initially that was of the interest? We went to Entebbe and we stayed at the best western. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like being in North America. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> really? Yeah. Great shower and yeah, very good food. And we didn't realize it, but we were right beside the mall, so we only had to walk 10 minutes and we could go in the mall. And <laughs> Yeah, Ned got to buy some clothes, so we got to go buy some clothes, so he even now has some different color socks for mom, not just black. <laughs> those ones are <laughs> Anyways, I found that very amusing. So, um, so we wanted to go for a walk, and as soon as we get out the door, all these people on motorbikes, why don't they go on their motorbike? I'm not going to go on back on the motorbike. No, 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 we're going to walk. So, so I figured out that you can only walk on one side of the street. Because you walk on the other side, you know. Well, because in Uganda they, they drive on the wrong side of the road, you know. <laughs> so that is really confusing. So anyways, so so we walked to this park and we thought, oh, we should try and go to this park. Yeah, well we had no idea the uh, park was a national treasure. The Entebbe Botanical Gardens. Have you anyone heard of it? And they even had, uh, just for Stuart Spaney's benefit, they had some of uh, that amazing uh, anti malarial Artemisia. Artemisia. <clears throat> and we, we walked in there, and this fellow came up and he offered to uh, be our tour guide. His name was Blake, and he was. And he was actually a survivor from the northern Uganda trauma with the Lord's Resistance Army, and he had personal friends that were kidnapped and never returned. And so he decided that he was going to become a biologist, and he'd come back and help his tribe. He had all kinds of brilliant insights about agriculture and different plant life, and he said they actually had. They, they said they, they were going to make him a chief, and, but he didn't want to get married until he was 40, and then the, the uh, tribe would choose a wife for him. So that was kind of interesting. And as we were uh, traveling around, we learned so much, and there was this group of people sitting, uh, singing, and praying, and I said, who's that? And he says, well, you don't know what, but they're the born again. <laughs> Seven days in Entebbe. Has anyone seen it yet? 
Isn't that powerful? Uh, 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 the Israelis uh, rescuing 102 people. It's, it's very creepy. And it's done with an Israeli dance group that gives the content. It's very intense. And they've got EDM in. And there you go. It reminds us what a difficult place Uganda is, but now Uganda and Rwanda, which have been through horrendous situations, are now called the two safest places in Africa to visit. It's not amazing. I just want to say that elections are coming up. I think it's been over 30 years in Uganda, and they're, they're looking to get a new leader there, and also in Rwanda, he's stepping down as well. It's been 24 years. So we need to pray that there's a safe transition. But one thing that was interesting is everywhere to protect you, even the, even the young woman guards, and he lost his credit card for a little bit, so the woman guard to the revolution was like, yeah, I need to go talk to the manager. I thought, am I allowed to talk to you? But I didn't say that. But everywhere, the hotel, they had security and, and all the banks. And, so you felt safe, you know, that was good. Uh, so, uh, and we got kicked off in, in Tempe at the Best Western. And uh, we had, there were two buses. There was one with the Americans in it, and there's one with the Africans. They gave us a choice, and we thought, well, we're in Africa, we might as well hang out with the Africans, right? And they were kind of surprised if we wanted to, but it was a wonderful experience uh, driving down there. And, and whenever they stop, you know, the people are trying to sell you stuff, and they even try to uh, grab the window and force the stuff in. So that was a little interesting. Banging on the window with their goat meat and then. Yeah. So it was quite an experience. Yeah. yeah and, and so we made it to southern Uganda, which is called Wentobo. And Wentobo is the site of the school for orphans. Uh, and on uh, one uh, by our good friend, the Reverend Dr. Cannon, me, Dad, and Connie uh, Grumi. I think there were about 500 students in there. And that was the site of the annual uh, convention called the Healing for the Nations Convention. And the theme, as we mentioned for this year, was Revolutionary Law, John 3. 16. So what was it like being there, Gary? Well, the good news was is it only rained once because it was outside, and I thought, oh, it's a rainy season. If it rains, we're in trouble. But they had big tents for everyone, including all the, the people that came as well. And there was apparently at 1.25 thousand people there, so that's a lot of people. So they had it on their field, which was probably three times as big as this, and they had a stage, and of course they had big, huge speakers, and the speakers were, the speakers' sound system was very loud, but uh, that many people needed it. So we were on the side, so we had, you know, the speakers in our, right, in our ears, which was probably good. Um, yeah, so I made sure I put my teeth on every day, so I didn't get bit by the mosquitoes and the bees. But it was very nice there, but some of them were that we stayed with them. Um, Six other people, uh, all Americans. So he did have one friend from again that can say to you. So he had two people in a room. So the bed wasn't exactly the largest bed in the world, but, but we made out and there was a mosquito net there. The exciting thing was there's no shower, right? They, you, there's just a little basin and then you just pour down the, the, the drain on the floor. And so it was, it was pretty exciting, but every, every day we were given a nice breakfast and then they gave us food and you know they had all these different kinds of yams and sweet potatoes and everything. That's what they could eat for food. Oh, and then one day they were worried they didn't have enough food and maybe they already planned it. So we got to fast that day. So we, we got our breakfast because we were at this other place, but the people they fasted for a couple of meals and then they got their dinner meals. So I thought, wow, they put fasting right in there. And actually that was good because then they, they had a big breakthrough in their lives after having but they were very eager to, every time you asked if they want to come up, they all come running up, they wanted everything that God could give them. And you know, even the very poor people had these beautiful outfits on, and it's amazing to me. Yeah, we, we had the privilege every day of being taught on revolutionary love in marriage uh, from 
of uh, Ephesians 10, uh, the first time uh, we talk, we, we talk about uh, the issue of bitterness and forgiving one another. And we spoke sort of at normal Canadian time, but they're based on briefly work. So we decided we're going to be much longer now. And, and we gave an altar call and thousands of thought for dealing with the bitterness issue. And some of our African friends said, we're, we're amazed that they responded if you only spoke like half an hour. It was very interesting. Yeah. It's a different cultural set. Yeah. Uh, so but with a hunger. Yeah. So, um, you know, Ed, Ed always has good theology. And then I got up and spoke. And I spoke about my mother and how she rejected me at birth and, and um, all that sort of stuff. And how I had to really forgive her. And she, she said she was sorry when she was older. And, and then also about how I had this piano teacher who was abusive to me and I had to forgive him. And so then, me dad, who actually his own father rejected him and kicked out their whole family and everything, he, um, he came up and so, and he talked about, you know, if you've ever had anyone reject you. Well, so many of them, they have these polygamous marriages. And so the one wife would be the favored one, or, or in his case, not favored. His family was kicked out and then he had five, and his father had five more wives. And then eventually, because he did, became a Christian after being so angry and everything about it all, he, um, he brought his friends back together and at the end. All of the other wives had left him because he got cancer and was dying. So she, she came back and, and then got pregnant with the wife and her husband. But anyways, he, he came up and then he, and we talked about some of the embarrassing things that Ed and I have done in our, in our past. And, um, so then they came up and spoke, me, dad, and his wife, Connie, and that was really great. She talked about things that she had liked. And, and so anyway, so um, it was great because it was all about forgiveness. So all these people came up to forgive their parents or their family members, whoever had hurt them, you know, or, or even they say, or churches, or your pastor, whoever it was, you know, and to, and to have forgiveness for them. So it was, it was really wonderful to see all these people and all their hands up like this, you know. It was wonderful. Yeah, one of the unique things that we saw was an altar call for people who were cohabitating, who wanted to get married. And these people flooded for this. I've never seen such a response, and me that I was ministering to them. And then we brought them back into the prayer tent and we were ministering and they would say, well, I'd like to get married, but, you know, it cost too much. Too many cows. Too many cows. And it's really interesting. And, you know, everybody has the same fears of relationship. And then the next day, uh, the couples that made a commitment to get married, they stood up and everybody prayed for them. We sent them back uh, to the local churches to get um, Mary, that, that was remarkable. Uh, so the five days uh, was electric. It was really revolutionary love and revolutionary forgiveness. And uh, then we went down to Rwanda, which is not that far away. And Togo was originally part of Rwanda. And when Togo is one of the original sites of the East African Revival because the East African Revival broke out, as you know, Kahini and among the Rwandan people. So we went to Bayumba, uh, which Peter and Elspeth uh, were there, so we were able to see the embrace for one of the workers and the mother's union and the father's union the youth union and the archdeacons and we had two and a half days. Uh, Bayumba was our most extensive uh, teaching and mission manual who's a uh, widower. So we, over two and a half days you can pour a lot into them. And near the end they said, do you have anything more to teach? And we did, but you know, just, we, we just wrapped it all up and then they, the mother's union uh, gave us a handmade gift of the Rwandan church. And so that was a blessing. And Archbishop Kalini, 
He was there in one of the old marriage seminars, so he gave the cultural context. He helped us interpret it, and that was very helpful because otherwise we can easily come across as sort of slightly out of touch North Americans, if you know what I mean. So that was, that was really helpful. Sometimes when we share things, they're really shocking. Like, I did like, like uh, doing dishes as a man, or going for a walk with you, right? That was a kind of a whole new concept for some people, and some were kind of happy, some of it was sort of shocking. So, after that, we went and we stayed at Kinelli for uh, the rest of the three weeks. With thanks to your recommendation, we, we ended up at the Solace Guest House. And at, it was an amazing location. And we stumbled in on a healthcare Christian fellowship convention or conference for all of East Africa. So a couple hundred uh, there, and, and what amazing people uh, we met. We, we hung out with them, we videotaped them, and we even met uh, a group uh, that we never heard of before, Albertans from Calgary, who lead sort of like an embrace for one equivalent for uh, Calgary is called Inspire Africa. What was it like? Yeah, they, they uh, buy cows for the widows and the orphans. You know, because in, in Rwanda and most of the countries, to have a cow means you have power and, and you're rich mm -hmm. and you can get other people to help them out. And so can I say something to that? Oh. This is what Carolyn spends the oh, Okay, Carolyn is going to We know cows, then. Uh, at one point, uh, the Rwandan government, they saw what was happening in Shokwe, uh, the embrace Rwanda, and they, they rewarded a whole bunch of families with cows. I think it was 250 cows they figured. Wow. Yeah, excellent. And then they found out cows, they need way too much water. Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, so cows is not such a great idea. Okay, so Elvis mentioned that cows are a mixed blessing because of the water needs. Now, so while we were there, we learned about uh, Solace Ministries, and they've got 60 different centers, and these are the genocide survivors, and the revolutionary love and forgiveness is just amazing. So, our next site. Uh, we were going to go to the jury, but you know, things change and it's like click. And instead, we end up in eastern Rwanda on short notice, but they all turn up in the Diocese of Kabungo, right near Tanzania. Anybody been to Kabungo? Yeah, and that was another bishop of Emmanuel. They all seem to be named Emmanuel. And he did at the uh, Healing for the Nations Convention. And so we'd already kind of met him and became his friend. And that was a great time, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was wonderful. So then after that, then they sent us, um, with our tradition cleaning, we went to Western Rwanda to Ruhango. And I'm sure you've probably been to Ruhango. Ruhango is technically in the Diocese of Kigali. That's a huge area. And this area was the site of 36,520 people being killed in 1994 at an Edenton uh, church building. They thought they'd be safe. And our interpreter at this marriage seminar, uh, Eric, he'd been uh, one of those people. But they would give you a choice. If you're wealthy, you could choose to be shot to death. Because that possible if, if you gave them money. But if you couldn't pay them, they would shed you to death. And so this lady right next to him was sort of like a mother figure. She had some money. So they shot her and she fell on top of them. And then everybody got machete and he got and then they they So he was underneath all his people. Yeah, and so when they did the grenades and set things on fire, he survived because he was deep enough in the pile of people. Uh, 
and he was our interpreter. Yeah, but you could see he had a, such a heart of revolutionary love and forgiveness. When you see what they forgive, you realize how petty we can be. Yeah, exactly. So, so his father was a pastor, so I'm sure his father's prayers helped yeah. when his mother died. And, um, you know, once once he got out of the church, he got captured, and he said he just couldn't tell us about it because then he wouldn't be able to translate anymore. So I guess he got tortured, you know, and terrible, terrible, terrible things. But now he works, he went to the university and took mental health. And he got a degree in mental health, mm -hmm. and he works with the refugees from Congo. And he says a lot of those people from Congo lived in Congo for a hundred years, but they speak Kiryanwanda from this language. And that the people that were the um, perpetrators, I think they call them, that they had gone to Congo and they had not been a part of the army, and so they're the ones that are forcing them out of Congo even though they've been there for a hundred years, so it's pretty terrible. Yeah, so the interpreter Eric married a psychologist who had never lived in Rwanda, but had returned as a refugee. So it's how God, God brings beauty out of ashes. So when we got there with Archbishop Cleany, we stumbled in on a 24-hour prayer vigil. At this particular at, at this church, and they had to build the other church on the other side of the street. And they've been singing and dancing and praying all night. And it was really exciting. And so as soon as we got there, you know, they said, oh, by the way, I was just going to you preach a sermon. You know, most people want to hear a sermon after praying for 24 hours. <laughs> and so he preaches the sermon, and then they say, and Reverend Ann, will you preach a sermon? So they got two sermons after praying up for 24 hours, and they paid attention, which doesn't sound very Western. And then after that, we go over to the, the marriage seminar, and this had only been planned the day before, because the schedule got changed, you know, plan G. And so 50 married couples turned up on a day's notice. That doesn't sound very best to me, but it doesn't. Yeah, and they were so attentive and engaged, it was wonderful, and, and Kalini, you know, what it gave to me. Our church and Kalini has so much uh, credibility. As a matter of fact, we went to the Peace Plan headquarters, uh, led by a man named Eric, and he says every time they're in a different country, uh, they're always looking for another cleanie, a key figure who knows everybody and has favor. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was moving. Then, uh, well, I just want to tell go ahead. About something. So, he talked about the, what's the name of that author that talks about the four forces there? Yeah, that would be Dr. John Gottman. So, criticism, contempt. Oh, yeah, yeah defensiveness, defensiveness and stonewalling. Well, none of them knew, I, I kept watching to see, none of them knew what a stonewall was, or what would stonewall be. So I said, well, and I guess next time we have to say brick walling, because they all have bricks, right? But yeah, they found that really interesting, that the woman could be critical and go nag, nag, nag the man, and the man would be running away, Stonewalling, you wouldn't talk to her. That's what happened with my parents. So, yeah, they were quite amazed to, to hear that um, there could be forgiveness and changes, and, and that um, the gifts, the five love languages, they'd never heard of that, and, and, or the five languages of forgiveness, they'd never heard of that. But some of them had said, I'm sorry, but none of them had ever said, I was wrong, or how can I make it up to you, or how can I change my behavior so I don't do it anymore. Or please forgive me, none of them are doing that. Uh, so this, these were revolutionary concepts, but we asked how many people would be willing to try this at home and in your marriage? And they, they were so open, they were so hungry and very excited. So then finally at the end of the three weeks, and we basically we taught our marriage almost every day except for little breaks, uh, but it was really exciting. Uh, we were back in the Gully, so we taught at an Anglican church called uh, All Saints and Pastor Josiah. And uh, he was, uh, he came into the fullness of the Spirit to be a full gospel businessman. And 
And so he just come to that church uh, four months earlier. So it was all new, about 350 people on Sunday. And so he, he, he was reading the back of the book and he said, well, we ain't in your ministries. He said, he said, is your wife here now? And this is in the middle of a three and a half hour service. And the lay reader had just preached uh, two sermons in a row, unexpectedly. So I thought, and this is, Tom's getting it, he says, he says, so, so we had to do some music and can you do an altar call for people to be baptized in the spirit and like speaking in tongues? That was the request near the, you know, England, so three and a half hours a day, we were glad to have an altar call. And, and I said, sure, we could do that. Well, I just want to say that I, I was sitting beside a lady who was translating for me, which was great because I was up at the front and he didn't always get translation, but every, they had three different choirs come up to sing, and they all sang about the Holy Spirit and what happened on the day of Pentecost and everything. So I said, you know, it's too bad nothing's going to happen. Yeah, so there wasn't time for a third sermon, so I, I basically just gave an altar call and made, made sure they were born. Uh, and, and I said, anybody who wants to be baptized with the Spirit and receive your prayer language, please come up right now. And hundreds of them came up. It was amazing. Amazing. There, and, and what do you do with all these people? Well, then we, we started, you know, we went around laying hands and Great for them. And we did, you know, the song how many people began singing in tongues. And it was a lot of fun. It was really good. And so after that, uh, they went back to their seats, being good Anglicans. And, and then he, the, the rector says to me, By the way, can you give an altar call for people to get healed? Uh, I said, I'd be happy to. So we did another altar call. This is like three and a half hours in. And they flood out their hand. We anoint them with oil and we're praying for them. And, and then the service, and when, when they were singing, you can tell the, the, the dancing about earlier. Oh, yeah. It we was delightful. Yeah, yeah, it was really fun. Maybe we could show them next week. The red and white gowns, they're jumping up and down. I thought, oh, James, you need to be here. <laughs> yeah. and, and then finally, after the service, at the, at the end of the service, he says, and will you lead a marriage seminar? after three and a half hours, we'd be happy to do it. So, they didn't all stay for that. Uh, but the real Peters uh, stayed for that. And then near the end, he said, anybody who is a widow or single, and some of them are genocide survivors, please sit over here. I was wondering when he was turning, he said, we need a group for you. And he talked to the key people, like, so like the ECW kind of ladies, the older ladies. And, and he said, would you like to start a group for our single woman? And, you know, and Jenna and he said, we'd love to. And he said, good, and you'll be leading it. And they started a group, so that way it was an amazing I was amazed they didn't have a group, but I guess the season is there, and it's very hard for them to get around. But there weren't very many older people, very few really. So we'll probably have to get driven around. The roads are sometimes exciting when <laughs> they'll have really good roads and then they'll have ones that they're working on every night. And they're like I, I said that my grandchildren would really like the dogs. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, so revolutionary love on Trinity Sunday. You know, it's rooted in John 3.16. John 3.16, God, it's God the Father, so love the world that he gave. There's only some the second person. Oh, the Trinity. Love brings giving, doesn't it? Love and giving go together. What more could God the Father give than His only Son? That's what I say is all about. That radical generosity. And generosity comes out of love, not out of the sky's falling or shame on you. And so we saw this amazing love. We saw it in Uganda, we saw it in Rwanda. People forgiving what we would think in the West is the unforgivable. Amazing. We shared the stories of, oh, remember that person that came back and they, they killed the husband and the child and they, they built, rebuilt the house? And, and our special place had all those people. So it gives you a sense of perspective. You see, 
They have been touched by the love of God in impossible situations. And there's beauty for ashes. And I, I said, what if we add half of the hunger in the West that they have? We'd say revival would win. What if we repented of the, the jadedness and the complacency? Even in our church, especially in our culture, God so loved the world, He gave His only Son that whosoever, whosoever believeth in Him won't perish, but everlasting life. Do any of you have family or friends that need John 3.16 in their life? Let's pray. So Lord, we, Lord when, when you're in Africa, you see the, the hunger and the openness, and we come back here and realize how cheated, cynical, and shut down we are. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, it's even affected us in the church. Lord, we, we repent of the complacency of our nation with such deep Judy Christian roots. Lord, give us the hunger of the Africans. Give us the forgiveness of the Africans, Lord. Yeah, so why don't we all say together that prayer, because there will be people watching this online, and this might be helpful. Let's just pray out to me. Dear Jesus, uh, I confess I need you. I repent of complacency, cynicism, detachment, and I said, Lord, make me hungry for you. I surrender to you. I affirm you as my Lord and Savior. I open my heart afresh. I turn from sin and selfishness. I want to live forever. I choose the gift of John 3.16, a revolutionary love. 